Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to BAFTA Guru's Your Film Career. Uh, this session is supported by Screen Scotland. Um, I, my name is Stephen Little. I am Head of Production for Screen Scotland and very much looking forward to uh, discussing about finding your way into the film and television industry uh, in Scotland. And before I introduce our uh, guests, uh, I just have some um, housekeeping to do. Uh, we have a captioner uh, available for anyone who needs it, so feel free to use that uh, service. And um, there'll be um, uh, the format of the session will be 45 minutes of conversation followed by a 15 minute uh, Q&A. But feel free to ask any questions uh, in the chat function throughout the session and I will do my best to um, filter those into the conversation. Um, so we'll get started. Um, I'll introduce my guests. So the first uh, person to join us will be Linda Fraser from Back to Vision. Hi, Linda. Um, and we'll introduce Zan Matud next, filmmaker um, who's just finished her uh, production, Go Home. And last but not least, uh, Arabella Pagecroft, who is a producer and founder of Black Camel Pictures. So welcome, everybody. Great to have you here. Um, it's worth starting by saying it's a very exciting time in the film industry in Scotland. Um, it's very busy at the moment, which is great, um, given the circumstances. And we're seeing a lot of growth and a lot of opportunities uh, within our sector. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Linda Fraser. Um, I'd like you just to tell us, Linda, how you started out in the industry and um, what you're currently up to. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, thanks to you and BAFTA for inviting me to be part of today's panel. I'm really delighted to participate. And uh, yes, you're right. It's a great time to be talking about this. Um, uh, I started my journey in my television, oh, when I was still at school, I knew I was a, a movie lover and I knew I wanted to be part of um, making films and television programmes, but it was the 70s and the 80s in a small village in Scotland and not a lot of opportunities. So I went down a photography route to begin with um, and then various courses, a national certificate and an HND in communications. I finally then made it to university and studied film. Um, so I, I knew what I wanted to do from the start and I know not everybody does, but um, I knew it was film and TV for me, but I thought it was camera because I came from a photography route. Um, but it wasn't until I started actually making films at uni uh, that I realised that um, actually my passion is organising people in production. Um, and so I started making short films uh, and then I, I got a break working on a feature film. And uh, to this day, I still work with some of those same people that I met on the, the very first job uh, years ago. So I worked in production for many years um, uh, and then I've now moved into um, training and I work for Bic2 Vision. We deliver short courses and a drama training programme of opportunities for people uh, stepping in, stepping up and stepping across into film and television. Um, scripted production is our, our main focus. That's me. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. Um, we're going to dig into more of what Bic2 Vision uh, do and how they can help um, our audience uh, make their first steps into film and television. Uh, but before we do that, Rosanne, uh, it would be great to hear your experience um, having recently completed our short film um, via a short circuit. If you could just tell us how you started out and where you are at the moment. Yeah, well, uh, thanks very much as well for having me today. Um, just briefly to introduce myself, I am Razan. I am Palestinian. I moved to Scotland around five years ago to do a degree in film directing. And then afterwards I've decided to stay. So I was trying to navigate my way around in Scotland and learn more about the industry to, to build my career in drama filmmaking. I have a background in journalism, did some TV reporting and documentary films in Palestine, but I moved to Scotland to do drama and I was like determined to start. Um, um, as like as anyone who would like to start, I was like just going out, doing a lot of networking and more networking and just meeting people and asking them about Scotland and how to find my way in. Um, I've, I can say that officially I've started when I got the chance to take part in Bill Rock Writing Residency supported by Creative Scotland to write my first uh, feature screenplay. And from there, I started, uh, I thought the next step for me to be recognized as a director is to get a short film made professionally. 
And gladly, last year, I got selected to work with Short Circuit. They supported my debut professional short film. I shot the film earlier this year, and this is as well another experience to talk about because we shot it during like COVID-19 times and we had to follow these restrictions. And we are at the moment now of delivering the final film, the final project. Um, I, I find my experience was quite um, interesting because I was starting from scratch, really knowing nothing about Scotland and trying to find what are the best routes. And also um, it's important and I'd give this advice to everyone, like make sure who you get your advice from. Because at the beginning, for example, um, as a Palestinian voice moving here to Scotland, I felt that maybe I wouldn't really find the opportunity. But actually by trying and working hard, I found some roots. And I think um, here there is like a growing interest in other voices that are coming from outside Scotland. They are more interested in diversity and including new voices. And I think, yeah, you, you can find your way in. That's great. So I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about that, you know, <clears throat> uh, kind of diversity aspect as well of filmmaking and how that's changed over the years as well. For the bit, um, Arabella, I'm going to bring you in next. Um, for someone who's just wrapped um, on your drama Annika, um, it'd be great to hear um, how you started and where you are now. And I'm probably going to follow up and just talk about Annika a little bit as well um, and why that's so important for Black Camel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, like uh, a lot of people who, who who are starting in the industry, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I, well, I'd, I'd been off at university and I didn't do anything in film and telly. I did anthropology, but I was always cu a curious person. And I think, you know, hungry to sort of be all the way during my university. I was producing theatre with the theatre company at Edinburgh Uni. And, uh, you know, and I, I put on fashion shows and, you know, I was always a kind of self starter, I think. And I, you know, I think, you know, if you're, if anybody's looking to get into the industry, I think that is probably one of the greatest traits that you need is to be really motivated, really a self starter. And you have to just, you know, make really, really make so many of your own breaks in many ways, as Roseanne has just said, and Linda as well. And I'm sure Stephen, you're no different. Um, but I think that that was probably my kind of you know, it is that sort of tenacious spirit, even when I look back at myself as a 20 year old and, you know, I've just turned 50. So it's a you know, it's a long journey now. Um, but, you know, that tenacious spirit has never gone away. And that's something that is really important over the, you know, the many, many years of your of your careers. Um, and I came out of college and I was ended up I did move to London and I was working in a shoe shop but I really really wanted to get into telly and film and I managed to get some work experience I saw an advert in the Guardian actually looking for trainees for a TV station that was just starting off called live TV which was the first cable station I think it was then and I wrote to them and said look you know I really want to come and do work experience and I did get in to do work experience in in those days and I'm glad this has changed a lot that, you know, work experience was unpaid and we don't do that at Camel anymore. You know, we, we make sure everybody's paid, which has been a really good change in the industry, I think. And, um, you know, but on the first day I arrived to do work experience, the PA to the sort of managing director who was Janet Street Porter, her sister died and I got thrown in at the deep end as PA to Janet Street Porter. And let me tell you, that was a baptism by fire. Um, so I ended up having three extraordinary weeks working for Janet. And, um, you know, suddenly I think they recognised that if I could kind of manage, you know, somebody of sort of Janet's um, reputation, that I would be, I, I would probably make it as a trainee. So I got selected to be interviewed for the traineeship and I got in as a trainee and it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful starting because we went from the MCR, which is like bringing in all the feeds, you know, we did every single department around the station. And so I spent a year doing that and just kind of cutting my teeth on all sorts of different things, but with another 10 trainees. So we had an amazing time. Um, and, you know, you know, I, I sort of just committed to it and I've got a drill going off in my ear now. So I don't know whether I should stop um, now and come back, Stephen, so I can shut the door. Shall I do that? That's fine. On you go. We'll um, jump back. Let somebody else pick up. No, that's fine. No, I was just going to, um, I was actually going to ask Arabella about, um, you know, being an Indigenous producer at this time, but we can come back to that. Um, Linda, as you know, being a training provider, it's exceptionally busy out there. We've seen 
uh, studios open up across Scotland. Um, um, you know, one one opened and then there's a few more to follow, and um, there we have to expand our crew base. And I just wondered if you could talk about that and how it's how it's different to when we started out. Um, you know, as as trainees compared to how the trainees will be starting out now. What they what, what can they expect nowadays? Mm, um, there's a, a lot more infrastructure now than there was uh, when uh, when we first started out. Um, I just think that there's there's a lot lot more uh, training scheme opportunities. Um, I was a screen net well, it was called the Next Training Scheme when I was on it uh, back in 1998, <laughs> um, and I was the production trainee on that. Uh, after having had a couple of jobs, I did an 18 month traineeship. Uh, with them and then the next program still going strong and uh, is taking on more trainees than ever and there's lots of other training schemes as well um so so that kind of support there's much more of it um and there's there's kind of a lot more organizations around to sort of help people um, and encourage people to come into the industry i think the industry's changed a lot since i started out in it i think it's become a nicer place to work we've got um uh, 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 we've got a way to go yet, <laughs> improving the sort of workplace terms and conditions and uh, whatnot, but it's definitely, you know, a much more inclusive uh, environment. Um, uh, and I just think that um, I, I'm, I'm hoping, what, what I think we see is that a lot more people consider this as a career now, a lot more people can see that there's the possibility of coming to work in film and television and sustaining that and certainly the increased levels of production that we're seeing makes it a much more viable option uh, than it's it's potentially been in the past with more sporadic work um yeah no that, uh, that's that's great Linda. thank you i think um you know it is much easier uh, in a sense to enter the industry now just because there is more work um as you say, we've got a long way to go. We're still not that visible to a lot of um, communities. Um, we need to obviously do work on that as well. But Arabella, we we're just talking about how busy it is at the moment with all of these uh, streamers and studios coming into Film in Scotland. And uh, as you know, Screen Scotland love that. We love big productions landing, but more importantly, we want to see our Indigenous producers thrive because that's where you really you know, build a sector. and having just finished Annika, your six-part series for Alibi. Um, I just wonder if you could tell us about that that journey and you know that kind of tenacious spirit you're talking about that you know you've been doing this for a number of years and you know that is a major achievement for Black Camel. Um, and just if you could elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, I mean you know thank you. It, it does feel like a major turning point for Black Camel and it has felt like a real achievement, I think, getting Annika greenlit because it has taken some years. Uh, you know, Annika is a six part drama series, as Stephen identified, and, um, you know, it has an £8.2 million pound budget and that budget is put together, you know, by uh, Alibi, Screen Scotland, um, All Three Media, and Masterpiece, uh, an American um, station as well. And, you know, but it originated as a radio show on um, Radio 4 and I listened and I heard Nicola Walker and it was a Norwegian set, Norwegian set. And the radio show was a sort of very interesting format because she broke the fourth wall and talked to us and it was only a very, very short 10 minutes. But I just, Loved it. And it was really funny. It had this great sort of, you know, um, this sort of great voice and anyway, clearly brilliantly written. So I followed up and also Nicola Walker is obviously hugely talented as well. I managed to secure the rights and I, I sold it to the BBC in development and developed it through BBC Scotland and went through two years of development at the BBC. But eventually um, it was Gaynor actually, and she didn't feel she was going to be able to sell it to peers um, at the BBC, who's head of drama, because he, the commissioner, he didn't want um he wasn't looking for crime of the week so you know I thought oh, what am I going to do we put it into turnaround and I I did all the schlepping that you have to do back to tenacity you know I went out to all the other broadcasters and then was sitting at the tv festival 18 months ago and UK TV said they were looking for a crime of the week and honestly I was like school girl I was like I've got it I've got it I've got it you know I've got what they need and I doorstepped um it was uh, Pete Thornton actually at the time. And I said, look, I think I've got what you need. And uh, I think I've got Nicola Walker on board. I think she'll stay the course. 
and we got engaged in conversations and they then said okay we'll commission another script and you know it went on and on and on and, you, and it, honestly there were so many meetings I had with my writer and I thought oh my god you know is he gonna you know he was exhausted by the amount of work that we had to do and then of course we finally got the show Nicola stayed with us Nicola Walker and we finally got the show greenlit at Alibi but Alibi, you know, doesn't have a huge amount of resource. So we had to go and obviously raise an, another six million in the marketplace. So it took, you know, it was it was a long job of putting that money together. Uh, but we finally got it greenlit during COVID, which was another challenge in itself. You know, we just shot through this long COVID winter um, and we started shooting in the middle of December and we wrapped on April the 2nd with an extraordinary cast and crew who were magnificent. But it's been brilliant, you know. Um, but you know, I, I mean, I, I am quite nervous, I suppose, as a as a small independent in Scotland, about the huge amount of business that is going on now in Scotland. And believe you me, I have been in front of Parliament and lobbying for all of this fantastic work that is now going on in Scotland. But you know, for small companies like us, you know, and you kind of think, oh, well, eight million is a good budget. Eight, you know, it's you've got to pay your crews properly as a producer. And if you're competing with streamers, you know, what crew are you going to get? So, you know, that I think we were kind of in a way, this is a terrible thing to say, but kind of almost it was fortuitous that we got a green light during COVID because nothing else was happening and we got an extraordinary crew. I mean, I wonder now if I was crewing up, you know, with the rig here and the huge shows that are shooting in Scotland, would I be able to get the calibre of crew that I've just had? So, you know, I think there are challenges. You know, we want the work for Scotland, definitely. Of course we do. And it's great to see the crews so busy. They could all be doing five jobs each at the moment. But um, as a producer, you know, I think, you know, that sort of middle range television, you know, we, we're potentially vulnerable. That's what I would say. Yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. Um, I, Roseanne, I just want to ask you, um, about your experience, um, you know, Arabella's kind of said, you know, how how hard it was to um, get a production up and running during COVID times. I assume the challenge was just the same, even though you were doing a short film, you know, it's, it's still a huge challenge um, because your budgets are, are tight at all levels um, when you're making any independent film or any, uh, you know, low budget uh, television production uh, no offense Arabelle but as you said compared to some of those streamers and um, their budget is for your whole series is probably for one episode so just to give our audience a kind of scale of what we're talking about was that what, how, what was yours it might Sorry. be the COVID, I think it might be the COVID budget of one of these streams <laughs> <Great Yeah. laughs> it's true so um uh, honestly like my crew like my team we were really excited to be able to make a film like you know last year it was really rough nothing went ahead I was meant as well to work on a documentary film project and it got cancelled so finally in January we were shooting a film even though despite like the fact that we were shooting under COVID-19 restrictions but it was um this excitement that we all wanted to make a film and we're all at the same level we're like um starting up this is our first like professional debut so we were all really excited to have the budget and to make the film um but in general like as well like mentioning on the fact that uh filming during COVID-19 that means that there were really great interesting people that were available at that time because of COVID-19 maybe if I showed the film on another time of the year they weren't available and also um I think in general, like thinking about the budget that we get, yes, we paid everybody, everybody was paid, we managed to film and to, to do all the shots and and the, sh the shoot went smoothly. But I, I think we should really consider to pay people well, not only to get people paid for their, their times. I personally um, worked on this project like since last summer, since August, since I got, got the, the, the film funded officially by Short Circuit, developed the script, went through multiple drafts because I'm a writer director as well in this project, and then um, shot the film and now we're finishing. It takes a really a long time, even if it was like a short film. And if you think a bit about um, the support you get, it's really amazing. You get a lot, of access, a lot of access to mentorship and master classes, and of course, your your voice get recognized, and you get as well advice on where to take your film later on. 
But I think the budget has to be doubled at least <laughs> if you want really the, the people to be comfortable making films and really feeling appreciated and paid well. And on another aspect as well, thinking about it, um, short circuit is only the only professional like um, short film funders like in Scotland. And when you think about the application, I think more than 400 people applied and then only nine who made it to the end to get their films. And then other people who want to make short films, they have to wait for the next year. And honestly, I think without having a short film in your pocket, you cannot really make the transition to something bigger into the industry in filmmaking. So I think this is something I would really like to have in Scotland that more attention towards short filmmaking, supporting more people, even like um, uh, shorter films, uh, and and just give them the money and make them make them make their films. And some of them they will manage and make the transition. I think it's it, it could be sometimes a bit of frustration frustrating to some people who would have to wait like for years until they get recognized for a short film to be made. Um, but for us, like for me, on the positive side, I managed to make this short film and I'm looking forward to the next. And on the same time, like developing as well other projects, thinking about my next step. I would like to see more opportunities that allow people really to find and grab this opportunity and instead of waiting and thinking, and some of them would drop out halfway through because they cannot really take the frustration and the exhaustion. Although there are a lot of talents around uh, in Scotland, and I think we all need to recognize that and cherish that talent. I think that's a good point, Rosanna. The, the, when you talk about the short circuit program, um, how important that is to young filmmakers. Um, well, new filmmakers, I should say, um, you can join that industry at any age, as we, as we know. Um, but what I would say is um, it's important to use your time. Don't don't wait um, for those opportunities to come along because you'll be waiting a long time. And there is a lot of opportunities out there on productions. And Linda, I was just wondering if you could talk about what those opportunities are. And um, just just because you can come into the industry at any level and, and learn something because there's so many departments and I think especially for directors uh, and producers and, and writers as well, experience in those departments um, is an important part of developing your career. Yeah, that's true. Um, but I also find I do a lot of work with uh, uh, new entrants and, and pre-entrants, talking to people uh, uh, to um, inspire them to think about working in film and TV. And um, in my experience, most people kind of present um, with an idea about working as a as a director, as a writer, um, as a camera operator or editor, um, because they've not kind of learned about all of the other roles that there are. I mean, that might, and a lot of people, you know, that is their focus. Um, but a lot of the work that we do is around supporting people into crew roles um, for all of the different departments. And I, I meant to count them up one day <laughs> to see how many different crew roles there actually are, because most people are drawn to the industry because they want to be part of the industry. They want to tell stories and some people have a focus already. But um, I think it's just worth mentioning that um, whatever your sort of particular skill set is or whatever your groove is, there's some place within film and TV where that fits. It's a really broad range of skills and talent that we need across the board. Um, so I would say have an open mind when you're starting out in film and television. And, um, you know, as, as you say, Stephen, it's important, whatever your interest is, to, to just try and um, get a foot in the door and see what it's like. I thought I was going to be um, working in the camera department <laughs> until I tried it <laughs> and then realised actually it was production. Um, and so I think working on short films is a fantastic place to start. Um, uh, all of us have worked on short films. I worked on one of Arabella's short films a million years ago. <laughs> um, and through doing short films, it's great fun. You get to be creatively expressive and you get to try out different departments and see how it feels and how it fits. Um, and that can be a really great starting point, getting to meet like-minded people, a really good network as well. And there's lots of opportunities through um, organisations such as GMAC Film, 
uh, Screen Education Edinburgh, SHMU up in Aberdeen. There's a network of film access organisations that run different kinds of schemes from time to time, uh, different training opportunities, but short filmmaking schemes. If you're between 16 and 19, there's the BFI Academy. Um, they're like a summer school where you kind of make a, a film together and there's an awful lot of support that they can provide uh, to help you with that. As Razan's highlighted the great work that's being done at Short Circuit with their various short film schemes, which is kind of like the next step on um, from that. So I really encourage people, and as you say, Stephen, not to wait to get onto one of those schemes. You can be um, getting like-minded people together and uh, making your own material with your phone. <laughs> you know, it's about the process and thinking through how you're going to tell the story and giving it a go. And um, where we come in at Back to Vision is we deal with people at sort of the point of entry, so uh, new entrants. And uh, there's different training courses. Uh, we run one called Hit the Ground Running, which is a, a new um, uh, two day intensive training course for new entrants. It's quite interactive, so it hasn't been running um, over the last year, but watch this space. Uh, we'll have some opportunities coming up um, shortly around that. So there's kind of training courses like Hit the Ground Running, uh, which can help give you an overview of uh, joining the industry. And then beyond that, as I mentioned earlier, various different trainee schemes that you can apply for. But it's not the end of the road if you don't get accepted onto those. There's only so many places on those uh, trainee schemes. It's perfectly possible to start out as a runner, as a location marshal. Um, a lot of these large shows that we're um, seeing being filmed in Scotland now require lots of location marshals. That role is essentially um, being a marshal around the edge of set. So you're the eyes and ears of the production on the outskirts. But for all you're on the outside, it really gives you a good idea of how the machine works and um, who's who and how the departments uh, interact with each other. So I'd kind of recommend those sorts of kind of entry positions, which just help get you um, your first sort of step into the industry. But uh, beyond that, the, the advice can be almost endless depending on what your interest is and what department you're interested in because each department does require specific skills or specific attributes um, and uh, you know we're here at Back to Vision for anybody with that interest you can come and talk to us and we can help kind of share that advice with you and we've got tons and tons of resources to help um, help you navigate that. I think it's, it's great you mentioned Hit the Ground Running, uh, Linda, because as we know, it's um, a great first uh, kind of course for people to take just to understand, you know, what the industry is all about and you know, how to get into it. And as Anne mentioned this, you know, you know networking opportunities. Um, it's always a, it's a difficult question to answer, uh, you know, how you grow your network, but the easiest way is to say, you know, try and take every opportunity, whether it is a location marshal or a runner, um, what I found when I was coming through the industry was it was my peers that really helped because um, especially in the current climate where it's so busy they're likely to recommend you for a job that they might get there's lots of great um, networks you know on Facebook and other resources um, via film buying as well um, that we see um, you know, there's, there's more calls going out for uh, you know careers to for those entry level positions so I recommend that people get onto that uh, as well get onto those groups um, and that and start your network from there. Um, Arabella, I was just going to ask you, um, you've produced a number of films and uh, TV series, what uh, training schemes have you utilised in the past and uh, what do you look for in new entrants? Linda, what have I used? Um, I think, you know, we've probably used um, most of them, you know, particularly recently, uh, NET, um, you know, I, you know, and obviously on Annika, we we you know did take on a number of, of trainees in lots of the departments, and it's fantastic. I mean, I love I love seeing the trainees making, you know, a uh, huge stride forwards. And I think you know that uh, you know you're absolutely right, Stephen. You know, this huge amount of opportunity and work that there is in Scotland um, is great to see so many new entrants and hugely hugely exciting. And I think you know, Linda, your tip of saying locations, marshals is a really good way in. You know, I would arrive on Annika set every day and be chatting to all the guys in locations, you know, and, you know, when you are location marshalling, if you are indeed going in that way, you know, 
stop and t- you know try and you know talk to the producers if you're interested in I don't know scripts or development but you know don't be intimidated by hierarchy you know if you do want to you know you kind of got to try and get notice locations is a hard job it's long hours for everybody isn't it you know it is long hours but you know actually producers probably notice people in locations because we all know that you work the hardest and you work the longest um uh but, you know, I also think in the art department, we had fantastic trainees in production, um, in costume. We saw some magical young people coming through costume and, you know, they're making great, um, great strides into the industry as well. So I think, you know, congratulations to everybody who's running the training schemes at the moment because they're doing a really, really good job. I mean, I think if I have any observations, I think it's, you know, I think we just need to be careful that we are so desperate for people that people don't move too fast. I think that's one thing I would say is that, you know, I mean, you know, I I spent five years as a runner and I'm not saying everybody wants to spend that long as a runner, but it really does give you a grounding in terms of really, really knowing what a set is and how a set operates. And if you do end up becoming, you know, a director or whatever, you know, you're really comfortable in that space instead of you're coming at it maybe from a different perspective. So don't feel you have to race up the ranks, enjoy each position, um, because I think in the long run, that will make you a better head of department um, or in terms of where your end goal is. I think that's a good piece of advice. Uh, I think I spent a few years um, as a runner myself and just working in those different departments, especially when you move into being a producer, um, understanding the needs of all those departments, you know, will stand you because they have gone forward. But I, there is a kind of, pressure to run up those uh, the ladder as quickly as possible um, and just take the next opportunity. Um, and I think also, sorry, I just would say is that don't think that anybody thinks that produce, that running is a lowly job because for a producer, you, I mean, for me, I, I quite like to run quite a flat hierarchy, you know, not really a hierarchy, quite a kind of flat organisation really. And I think, you know, the runner is as important as the producer, you know, everybody is such an important cog in the wheel. And I think, you know, as I look around, you know, you know, I often think, you know, if I was to end up on a desert island, the only people I would want would be a film crew, but, you know, film and TV crew, because every skill um, is is absolutely invaluable and everybody brings something to the table. And I do think that's why I still, after all these years, absolutely love this industry. And I get to the first day of principal photography and I look around me at the people who are working you know, on our show, and I am bowled over with emotion, often to tears, because I am that sort of sentimental person, because I just love what everybody brings, and that, you know, you're sitting there as a producer going, oh my god, my show's finally going to get made, it's going to get made, or my film's going to get made, we can't make our films without all of you who are doing all of these brilliant jobs, and so, you know, the runner is as important as the sound record, just as important as the location marshal. Um, so feel valuable in what you do because you are incredibly valuable once you're in. I'm off my <laughs> um, Rosanna, I was just going to bring you in next. Um, so someone's pointed out in chat like how uh, competitive it is and how to make that uh, step into professional filmmaking. Um, it's worth saying just from Screenpot Scotland's point of view, you know, we have uh, you know, kind of tripled our uh, funding for certain um, organisations so there's more trainees and we are looking at more um, opportunities uh, such as I mentioned GMAC to Little Pictures which is kind of um, a kind of entry-level filmmaking scheme and then as Rosanne's touched on Short Circuit um, you know always looking to do more and, and bring in apprenticeships online hopefully uh, soon so that people can find a way into the industry and as Arabelle touched on find paid opportunities within the industry because unpaid is um, not really where we want to be any, any anymore but Rosanne just given how competitive it, competitive it is because uh, there's no getting away from that fact have you got any advice to people who are applying for training schemes um, that you could share? Yeah, totally. I think, first of all, you really need to know what exactly you want and what's your route. And then on the route, you collect those tools by like applying to this, these particular schemes. Um, I think as well, I would really advise everyone just to stick to the projects that really matters to you. If you want really to make something, make it with passion, especially if you're start, starting with a short film and you want to be seen, don't copy others, just to stand out by your own vision and your own voice and use the tools that you could have, whatever you have around. That's if you want really to level up within the industry. 
and um, again, um, um, networking, networking, and I was actually quite really surprised by how much support you get here in Scotland. For example, like I would really just email people and ask to meet for a coffee and ask for advice, and they will turn up and they will give you really valuable advice. Uh, people are really responsive and happy to help. So really take advantage of that and approach people and ask them about the best routes. It's good to get advice from the people as well who are already um, made their own way in the industry and get um, their advice on the things that you should do and the things that you shouldn't do and what are the best routes if you want to achieve something. That's in general is. And um, yeah, be hardworking and determined, keep thinking about it, uh, devote a lot of time to it because it's not easy. But if you really want to make it, then make it your number one priority and just keep learning, uh, meeting people, working on projects, even if sometimes some of the projects won't see the light, but it is still important because those pages of scripts that I've written in the past who didn't ever like made it anywhere, though are the, those are the ones that made me make the steps that I'm doing now. So don't dismiss anything that you do, just keep keep up and do more and more all the time. That's excellent advice, Rizal, thank you. Um, I just touched on another point in the chat, um, someone saying that you ancient positions tend to be geared towards younger people. Um, I think, um, COVID has actually been a bit of a leveler there as, and um, given the number of productions coming in, um, I know that a lot of the training providers are looking for people who can change their careers uh, from who've got relevant skills that can be transposed into the screen sectors. We've tried to build a true base. Um, Linda, back to being active in that area as well. Um, I was just wondering if you wanted to kind of talk about that um, and a similar um, any advice for people applying for uh, training schemes because I'm sure you've seen many a CV in your time. Uh, yes, indeed. And uh, well, transferable skills are fantastic. I mean, I think a lot, um, I think actually, you know, I don't know, Arabelle, if you would agree with this, but um, I think actually new entrants tend to be older in um, film and television than maybe in other industries. It's, it's really actually unusual for school leavers or uh, sort of people under 20 uh, stepping in and that's something that we are trying to kind of look at and uh, you know work with others uh, to try and make opportunities for younger people <laughs> uh, because you know I think experience is really valuable life experience is really valuable um, and a film set is quite a um, can be quite a tricky place to navigate because it's large it's temporary it's pop-up um, and so, you know, we find that a lot of people bring life experience from all kinds of different backgrounds to it. And as I touched on before, we need electricians, we need hairdressers, we need makeup artists, uh, we need engineers, you know, to an extent, and um, just all kinds of different skills, plasters, painters. There's lots of transferable skills from different sectors that we really need. Um, so I would encourage anyone with transferable skills and life experience to get in touch with us as well and we can um, we can kind of help share a uh, sort of the ins and outs of different departments that you might be interested in. And in terms of advice for doing applications for trainee opportunities, I think um, really work at your application. Take as long as you can working on the wording for the application because it really is all that the selector has to go on. <laughs> um, you know all about you, um, but but make sure that that's on the page and, uh, and, and really work at that text to make sure it represents you and your passion and interest um, and working on film and TV as much as possible, which maybe sounds like obvious advice, but having read a lot of applications, sometimes it's very difficult because you're rooting for somebody, <laughs> but they maybe just haven't articulated on the page what you're looking for, um, or as well as the next person. So think about your application from the point of view of somebody reading it, and does it, does what you've said meet the criteria that they've set out for that opportunity? I think that's, that's good advice, Linda, because a good application won't go unnoticed, even if it's not successful for the scheme it's applying for, because things are so busy, it's not unusual for um, these applicants to maybe um, to be given good feedback or um, 
for productions to ask if there's anyone that, that didn't make it and any advice to any, any uh, people that are available to them. So, you know, I think putting uh, you know that effort into those applications will will help. And um, I know the training providers as well are very good at giving feedback, so you'll learn from your application. And you know, some we are trying to do at Screen Scotland is you know run more training opportunities, so they're not once a year. So if you miss the deadline, you don't have to wait a whole year. We're trying to you know up the number of training positions that we that we can um, and to answer someone's question in the chat. These big productions are looking for local crew. The last thing they want is to be flying crew in and putting them up in hotels because hotels, uh, you don't see that on screen. Um, it's great for the, the tourist industry, which we absolutely want to see recover, but um, we want our local people working on local productions. Um, that's hugely important to us. And we see the streamers and the studios saying the same thing. You know, They want local people to learn um, from their crew as well. Um, uh, we we're kind of coming into our, our q and a session um you know, a question i want to ask all the panelists um is if there was one what, what was the one piece of advice you were given and um, that you wish you'd received much earlier in your career mm. and i'm going to pick on razan first for that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um just reflecting on a personal experience so um at the very start for example like um, I'd be wary sometimes where to go because I wasn't sure if people would be interested in a Palestinian voice in Scotland or not. And sometimes people would give you an advice, you now focus on something that's really purely Scottish. And if you're not from Scotland, maybe it's really hard for you to get through. I ignored that advice. I've applied with some Palestinian ideas and I've brought my own as well perspective here as a newcomer living in Scotland. And I felt that was highly valued, valued actually. And I think um, in the creative industry, they're always in the look for new voices and new perspectives. So bring that in and don't hesitate in applying and trying, even if in the past they've never accepted uh, anybody who's from a different background, just go ahead and do it and be the first. So for example, my first screenplay that I've developed here in Scotland is sit in Palestine in Gaza and one day if I'm going to make it, it's going to be in Arabic, but it got developed here in Scotland. And I'm really appreciating that opportunity. And I think it's really great to have my voice really evolving here in Scotland. And I'm telling everybody as well that I am writing even the story that is set in Palestine. I'm writing it with the new perspectives that I'm bringing in from my Scottish pals who are really helping and supporting my projects. So I think just only, um, don't uh, limit yourself and don't listen just to stereotypical advice about like, you no, know, they're looking for so and so, just to try and apply and just do it and try different things as well. Excellent. Linda, would you like to um, answer the same question about um, any advice you'd wish you'd received early in your career? All the advice, Stephen. <laughs> um, it's what motivates me to do what I do is that there, there wasn't really advice, there wasn't yeah, just had to navigate it. Even though I'd done a degree in film and I'd made short films, I found kind of joining the industry just a such a different experience. It's a different groove from short filmmaking. Um, it's it, making short films certainly prepared me well for the sort of attributes I needed to work in film and TV. But I kind of really lacked to understand how the big machine worked. And um, Yes, <laughs> so all the advice that we pull together now and the schemes that we do, but I think um, just I agree with what uh, Razan said and it, uh, for me personally it would be don't worry so much, just do it anyway. <laughs> Absolutely, no it's um, as I think Annabelle touched on, not to be in too much of a, a rush when you're in those early parts of your career because um, you get to ask all the best questions um, when you're a runner. Um, once you get old, older and more experienced, you're supposed to know these answers. Um, Arabella, is there any um, piece of advice that you'd wish you'd received earlier? Do one thing well. That's what I think. And I think somebody gave that advice to me yeah. when I was I just made, I've made Outpost. And I was thinking, oh, what am I going to do next? Well, I need to have like loads of projects. And I need to have this big slate. And, you know, and a friend of mine just said, look, do one thing well. And that, then we decided 
you know, as a result of that bit of advice to make Outpost 2, then we made Outpost 3, then we made a game, then we made a graphic novel. And it, I think it just stood us in good stead forever, you know, learning how to work with one project and do it really, really well. And I think whether, you know, Rosanna, I'm sure you'd echo that, you know, in terms of the short films, I'm sure both Stephen and Linda would as well. But I think, you know, I still, I, I think I even quoted myself back at myself. Sorry, that was a friend's quote, but I was saying that even just to Kieran the other night. I was like, oh, can we just do one thing well? Can we do it well? <laughs> so I think that's one piece of advice. The other piece of advice that somebody didn't give to me, but I just would like to pass on is, you know, I've, I've never been a very organised person. And I think it's something that maybe often sort of stands in the way of myself. You know, I'm a little bit ADHD in terms of, in fact, a lot ADHD, I think, in terms of who I am. And I think I didn't keep all my contacts and I think you know if you're in LinkedIn you know just really look after your network because I didn't do that at a very tender age and if I would looked after that network from a very young age I would have a hell of a contact book now and I so that I think is my you know I would say to everybody take that away and you know start squirreling, squirreling away all your contacts and don't lose them for goodness sake but then I think that's you know most people are on LinkedIn or, you know, there's, there's different, it's different now than, you know, when we were going up the ladder as, as um, juniors and runners, I think. Yeah, no, I, fair enough, I got the same piece of advice and, and took it quite seriously. Everyone I met, if I got their phone number, I put their name uh, into my phone and their job title um, and just built that up. And someone said to me, you're never too busy to, you know, save the information. And although in production, it sometimes feels that you've not got the time you know, just do it straight away. The other piece of advice that I always uh, adhere to is uh, do everything with enthusiasm. It's um, if you if you're if you get even some of the most boring tasks um, in production, you know, do it with do it with enthusiasm, do it with a smile on your face, and people remember that as well because um, you probably find a lot of uh, producers and HODs have had to do uh, those jobs themselves, and they appreciate someone you know doing any of the uh, smaller jobs just did it really well um, and that'll be remembered uh, you know in future productions. Um, Arabella, there's a, a question I think came in that's probably for you. Um, it's for people who have got projects. What's your advice about them approaching uh, production companies? What is the best way for you know upcoming writers and directors to approach you? Well I mean now it's it we really would prefer projects come through agents um, just because of the volume. So I would, if you have got projects and you haven't, you haven't got representation, I would really put your energies into getting representation, not cold calling producers. Um, unless um, it would be different if it's a short film and you're packaging and you're working, you, you want to find a producer, you can get into the you know, short circuits and, and you can begin to find out, you know, who are the emerging producers who want to buddy up with a writer or a director. Um, but so I think that that would be my current advice would be really try and, you know, um, you know, either try and as Roseanne has done, try and find a way to get your short film made. And if you've got a feature length project or a pilot script for TV, I would really try and get representation with one of the agents um, before cold calling producers I mean obviously cold call away but you know it is a, it's a fast road to disappointment because because of the volume of work that are just submitted to us even through the agents let alone through people who haven't got representation yeah but I think uh, you know um, we've also had a question about um, you know getting crew jobs um, Linda there's lots of training organizations out there that are always asked if they um, have got any um, people you know that are available um, you know what's what is the best way for your entrance to find a way into some of the bigger productions mm. it's, it's really tricky and um, especially the big productions uh, they have a, a, a form called an NDA a non-disclosure agreement which everybody in contact with the production has to sign so you can't talk about it <laughs> so it's, it's very um, difficult to find those opportunities because you won't you won't hear about them um, and in order to give the large productions comfort uh, you know organizations like ours help to kind of find out what it is the productions need and connect them with pools of people who are trying to get into the industry or are you know at different levels um, there's directories like film bang uh, there's facebook groups um, you know there's various facebook groups where there's crew calls 
more factual and we're starting to see drama productions using Facebook groups to recruit from as well. Um, uh, try to be visible by listing yourself in the directories. Some of the film offices, Edinburgh Film Office, if you're based in the Lothians in Edinburgh, you can list yourself on their website as well. I know that um, Screen Scotland uh, have also, you know, collate uh, interest from people and, and try to share opportunities that come up. But just to explain in case it's not clear, we are a freelance industry, meaning that we work, all of us work on production to production, job to job, and those productions just pop up almost without warning <laughs> sometimes, and at short notice can be recruiting. So um, it's, it is a sort of career-like weather in that um, regard in that you have to be proactive in your job search um, and try to be visible and you know to your point um, Stephen that you made before about kind of networks you tend to hear about it through the networks as well so um, you know events like this is fantastic to get an insight into the local industry because it's kind of different in different parts of the UK as well um, where the hubs are and where the sort of joining points are uh, so yeah I would say you know, do your homework and be proactive in reaching out to the support organisations that there are, which we can kind of share information about uh, through Back to Vision. And Back to Vision being one of those organisations that exists to help connect you with opportunities that come up. So it's also worth mentioning things like TRC run their RAD programme as well, um, as uh, more focused on factual productions, but they do uh, scripted as well. Um, and we're, we're seeing, you know, more of these um, expanding the numbers that they can take on in response to um, the industry as it, as it grows. Uh, there's, a, there's a question coming here. Um, it's a tough one, so hope you're ready for it. Um, besides short park circuit, um, how else would you look to finance a short film? Uh, it's a tough one indeed, yes. Um... Well, um, I personally like made the film that's funded by Short Circuit, but I have friends, for example, who uh, managed to do films by crowdfunding, for example, and they build like uh, small, small budgets and they managed to make films. Sometimes people would think initially from the start, like about um, projects that can easily be produced with limited crew and they make it by their own means, or some people would save a little amount of money and make the films. There are some people who do multitasking on their films, like the write, direct, and edit at the same time. So that minimizes as well the crew. I think whatever um, thing you've got around, just yeah, do 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 it and make a film. And um, there are as well people who go and make documentaries because it's easier to make and easier to fund. If you can like manage a camera and you have people to trust, you can just make a documentary and then transition to the drama and I think short circuit as well welcome that if you're coming from a different filmmaking um, aspect like if you're a writer wanting to direct for the first time if you made documentaries and making a transition to drama they welcome you um, but I think it's good for you to build up these skills and make and work on other projects you could work on other films film projects not, not necessarily you're the one who's writing or directing but do any other skill, being on set and being around a film team will give you insights on how things work and you will develop as well with that. Um, yeah, and or, or come up with your own idea or your own way. I'm sure there are always ways for you if you're really passionate about it and you want to make a film. Can, can I just say, I do, I do think, you know, it's quite interesting this discussion that we're having because a lot of it is about crew and about how you get into the industry. But I, I think it's really good to be thinking about directors and writers and producers because, you know, it's really hard to be to become directors, writers and producers while you're being crew because the crew hours are so long and, the, and it, that is a lifestyle choice. So I think that is probably, you know, one of the trickier um, discussions, isn't it, is about, you know, if you become crew, you have to work out, are you going to take a break after a job because you want to do some writing? Because you're not going to want to do writing after an 11 hour day on the, on set. So I don't know, I, I guess, you know, they are just different training programs. There's different training programs, for entry points for crew, but I don't know. It's good experience, even if you want to be a writer, to do some time on the floor and to understand what goes on, you know, and there's a, 
you know, there's a real pet hate from first ADs who have script editors who just come in and they're suddenly producers and they sit at the monitor being all script editing producer and they've never worked on the floor. So I don't know. I mean, I'm saying a bit of a jumble of things, aren't I? But, you know, I think for me, that's just something I'm kind of conscious of that we we are, we, we, we need to differentiate between how you become writers, directors and producers and become crew um, because they are, they're quite different. Yeah. And sometimes it might be better to go and be a waiter and work your hours so you can have the time to do your creative job. I don't know, you know, that's, that's you know, I wouldn't, that wouldn't feel like a compromise if your real desire and commitment is to write in any way. Absolutely. I think it's yeah, something that we've always been trying to encourage is more uh, script editor trainee positions because they are few and far between in Scotland and I know where I've there. You've got your saying about them sitting at the monitor, but it is a, a way for them to get in and get that you know practical experience on script. And you know we want to see more of those opportunities um, for trainee script editors on uh, the productions coming in. Linda, do you want to touch on the script uh, editor trainee scheme? Um, uh, yes, I, I can. But I was also just going to agree with Arabella. It is different routes, mm -hmm. and whilst you know, just to kind of make the advice clear, whilst it's a good idea if you want to be a writer, producer, or a director to get some experience on set to see how it works before you turn up on your first day as a director, <laughs> you're the least experienced person there. You know, it's a good idea to get that balance. But I just agree with you, Arabella, that, you know, it doesn't qualify you. There's nothing in going up through the ranks and the crew that's going to qualify you to be a director or qualify you to be a writer or indeed a producer. Um, uh, there are different routes. And, um, you know, I think for anybody who's really serious about those roles, my advice is to if, if you want to be a writer, write as much as you can, write with purpose, um, write for um, an audience um, and understand the um, sort of commercial background to how productions and television shows are made and what what the audience to that script is. Um, uh, you know, learn about that side of it to blend it in with your creative voice and equally if you want to direct direct as much as you can. Don't be choosy, direct theatre, commercials, pop videos. It's all good experience in learning your craft and um, and equally exercise your um, you know creative abilities and have something to show people, whether it's for funding for your next short film or trying to get an agent or you know convincing somebody that they want to be part of your creative team. Um, so yeah, I do think that there's different advice on the script editor front, Stephen. Um, so we run a script editor traineeship uh, at Beck 2 Vision um, and uh, it's placement based. We place uh, the trainee script editors um, with uh, independent production companies for um, for the duration of their learning uh, so they can work on actual live productions. Um, and yeah, it's a key role and we don't have a huge crew base of script editors and, um, in Scotland, so we're just keen to increase that that pool. It is more traditional in television than film, uh, for uh, as a route to producing for people to come up as a script editor and then move into producing um, television drama or scripted television. Um, it, it's less of a, a route in film in that way. Arabella can talk much better about routes to producing films. It's uh, one of the hardest things to do. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, another piece of advice that I was given, and it really unlocked it for me early on. I mean, I was in my late 20s when I started producing, but the somebody, I went on a course, it was like AAVE, one of those courses, and, you know, honestly, it cost a lot of money to do that course, um, which Screen Scotland um, uh, helped pay for, and I came, <laughs> I think, I came back from that course, and it had given me the keys to the kingdom, which was... You know, no one gives you permission to be a producer. You just have to take it. And I think that's the same with being a writer and the same with being a director. You know, nobody gives you the keys to the kingdom. You've just got to want it and you've got to work out how to do it. And, you know, and that is different with, with crew, I think, because you do, you do, you can get into the industry and onto a set and you're off. Whereas I think, you know, if you can get, you know, like Roseanne would say, I, I, do you have a producer, Roseanne? Do you have somebody who worked with you on Short Circuit? I mean, it's just, you know, when you find those, you've got to kind of find your people, find your tribe, I think, as a producer early on. And 
you know, Kieran and I found Steve and we made three or four films together straight off the bat. Everybody, you know, we just kind of like all clung to each other and we're, we're all going to do it together and then not let go. And I think it's really hard for finance to turn down a writer, a producer and a director, you know, who sit there and are so committed. So find your gang, you know, if you want to produce or if you want to direct and you want to write, because I think, you know, if you can then, you know, apply to Screen Scotland and get out to Cannes when we're all allowed to travel again and you've got your project and, you know, you can persuade people. I mean, your project's got to be good and you've got to get it into market ready and you've got to done a lot, a lot of work. But it's hard to say no when there's three people absolutely committed to getting something made. So, yeah, find your find your team as a as a producer, writer, and a director. You know, and that that's hard work just finding the right people. You know, maybe you met them at college, maybe you're meeting them, you know, on these schemes. You maybe meet them in the pub. Who knows? But you know that. But you know, I think that would be my advice. Nobody gives you permission. Just get it done. Great advice. I'm aware that we're slightly over, so I'm sorry to the people who've asked some excellent questions and we've not quite got to them yet. Um, I think... Um, Stephen, can I just answer? I was just really conscious that we have got this elephant in the room about sexual harassment and Noel Clark, and I, I, I can't, I think, I don't want to speak to, for BAFTA, but I just yeah. want to say we've just made a really low, tiny budget BBC iPlayer series, which had intimate scenes and you know, I think there has been massive changes, I feel, in our industry. And we've just worked with an intimacy coordinator. It was my first intimacy coordinator that I've ever worked with. And it was just the best thing because the actors felt absolutely safe. I felt safe. I was actually directing that scene as well and directing the show. And I think, you know, so I, I just want to say to, is it is it Kaz Armstrong, just to say, you know, there are really, as a producer, you know, the producers are working hard to make sure that the toxic environments are changing and doing everything that we can. And I would be really devastated if you didn't want to come into the industry because of these fears. So, um, you know, I would just say that as a producer, you know, um, we we are doing our best to make sure that everything um, is stamped out. Yeah, I think just to add to that, that um, financiers are now doing a lot more to ask productions um, if they've got um, policies in place bullying harassment and uh, as well as other uh, policies. And I think um, people are much more aware that the intimacy, intimacy coordinator is a, a great uh, example of that, how the um, sector's moved on in recent years um, because they didn't have that um, when I was starting out. And I know that it's difficult for um, new directors and even um, more experienced directors um, to deal with these situations as well. And, you know, they're, they're, they always try and do it in the, the best environment they can, but to have someone who can talk openly about it and give, you know, actors um, that confidence uh, and, you know, just discuss it quite openly um, really helps uh, everyone involved. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone for joining uh, the discussion today. Um, I think there's some really good advice being given out there. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see some of our audience on set um, in the future. So thank you everyone for joining. See you later.